first introduction into the sport was Hoist Gracie. To me, he is the beginning of the sport. I saw the first UFC, Royce Gracie won everything. And I was always wondering, how come a small guy like this can beat up everybody? We've never seen anyone like that. Unbelievable. He can choke him out with his gi right here. He looks like he's in tremendous yeah, pace. He's I was 15 when I saw Hoyce fighting. Hoyce was a great inspiration. What a performance by Gracie. Gracie, a master of the choke. He was doing something called Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and beating everybody of all different styles and all different sizes, and I wanted to do what he did. I'm like, man, I don't care where I gotta go, I have to learn that art. I have to. One, two, three, four, four. Exposed us all to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Kind of made it very popular. It caused the evolution of the sport. Gracie will always go down as the man who revolutionized martial arts. He's the godfather. He's the man who started it all, and we all bow down and kiss the ring of Hoist Gracie. A master martial artist. Lesnar and George St. Pierre, before Randy Couture and Chuck Liddell, there was Hoist Gracie. Let's go. Those of you that want to know what we're all about, this is 10% luck, 20% skill, 15% Mixed martial arts is one of the most popular sports in the world. There are thousands of professional fighters across the globe. And tens of thousands more training in the hopes of joining them. Nearly all of them study Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I just loved it from the first time I seen it, first time I was on the mat, first time I ripped an arm lock, I was like, man, this, this is amazing. There's no form, it's just, you know, what works, man. You know, what makes the guy say uncle. 99% of the fighters today in UFC and every show, they know jiu -Jitsu. Here we go, that's it, that's a But just two decades ago, few people outside of Brazil had even heard of the discipline. And only one family held its secrets. When you thought of martial arts in the past, most people thought of karate. They thought of kicking and, you know, breaking bricks and stuff. Nobody thought of people using incredible technique and leverage to submit guys and choke them. Then, in a single night, one family member put a stranglehold on the fight world that has yet to be released. We've never seen anyone. Royce Gracie was the guy who introduced this sport to millions of people around the world. He's out, that's it. He kickstarted the entire sport of mixed martial arts. One of the best bouts in the history of the UFC. Royce Gracie has uh, always uh, been an idol of mine, and uh, I always uh, look up to him, and uh, I, I wish I can uh, make a history just as he, he made uh, back in the day. Watch the left hand, that's it. Gracie chokes him out. He will always go down in history as one of the most important figures ever in martial arts, if not the most important figure. Royce is the ruler. He is the greatest champion no, on the planet right now. The history of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu goes back to northern Brazil in the early 1920s. 
Gastel Gracie, father to Elio and grandfather to Hoyce, performed a political favor for a Japanese neighbor, Count Koma. In exchange, Koma taught Gastel's sons, Carlos and Elio, the basics of Japanese jiu-jitsu. Then the boys adapted their own version. My father couldn't do it because he was too small. So he sat down in the corner and on his head, he transformed. Well, if I do it this way, if I change a little bit, I can do this move. So he didn't invent the car, the wheel. What he did is he invented the jack, the leverage. He understood that if you wanted to fight bigger and stronger opponents, which was all he could face, he needed leverage and intelligence. It doesn't matter how big, how strong the person is, how heavy the person is, once we go to the ground, it's pretty much even out a lot. You don't have to be acrobatic to do Gracie Jiu Jitsu at all. You don't have to be strong, you don't have to be fast. Like everything else, you gotta know what you're doing. Once you know, it's easy. Carlos and Elio moved to Rio and opened a new academy. They set out to prove the superiority of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. My uncle would go to newspapers and put ads. If you think that you're a tough guy, show up at this address. If you want a broken arm, broken leg, just call me at this number. Show up at this location. I mean, we're going to beat you up. <laughs> Their first opponents were people from Capoeira. That's a very common martial art in Brazil. Then anybody from judo or from Japan or wrestling that would show up from America in Brazil. Not because we're arrogant. We're in a quest. They can't teach something if they don't prove it. They got... So famous, the elite of Brazil was starting to want to be a part of this and learn this. So all the politicians, the president, ministers, uh, foreign diplomats, everybody wanted to, to have classes and learn this thing. My father was actually the first national sport hero in Brazil. As Carlos and Elio got older, their sons began to take over the business and to compete. Elio's sons, Horian, Helsin, Hickson, and Hoyler, became stars, winning tournaments around the world. But Hoyce, the youngest at the time, never reached the big stage. Growing up on this family, everybody fights. Everybody at one time step in the ring. And there's so many of us that sometimes you kind of get push aside, so we're like, can I do it? I wanna do it, where's my turn? There was no way for him to compete, so he went to the States. Horton came over and started to teach in a garage, set up some mats, teaching some friends, spreading the word. I came in December 84, didn't speak the language, so as I was teaching the students, didn't have to speak much, just point and say, stop. Slowly, word started to spread about Horian's gym, where a new martial art was being introduced to Americans. I'm like, man, I don't care where I gotta go, I have to learn that art. First time I ripped an arm lock, I was like, man, this is amazing. The beauty of jiu-jitsu training is that it allows you, in practice, to go 100%. There's a big difference between that and kickboxing training, because if you stand in front of each other and throw full blast punches and kicks at each other, you're going to run out of training partners. Other brothers came in, and we had a couple different garages in town, and different houses, and teaching, and everybody got full. So that's when Horian decided to open up the Grace Academy. Horian wanted to expand the, uh, the scope of Jiu-Jitsu throughout the world. He thought, well, the Gracie Challenge works so well in Brazil, we got to do the same thing over here. People could bring in, uh, you know, as much money as they wanted, and uh, Horian would match the money, and then they just, they just fight. There was always a friend, 
of one of our students that's a black belt in karate, that's a wrestler, that's a black belt in judo, that his stuff he thinks is better than ours. And Okay, let's do it. Orion would say go. Whoever it was would just rush across the mat, you know, easily dodge the, the kick or the punch that came out, grab him, take him to the ground, and apply a choke or an arm bar. Always be over very quickly. Most of the time, Horian never collected the money from him. So the Gracie Challenge was not so much about making money, really it was about proving a point. Every challenge they had was taped. You have to sign a contract. Whoever wins the challenge gets uh, rights to the video. So they were filming all these challenges. They started disseminating these tapes. Within the fighting community, started getting this momentum going. Until people saw the inaction tapes, there was really no awareness of what, it would ha what would happen when a grappler met a kicker, a puncher, a striker. I had been thinking about it for years, but when I was back in the Marine Corps, it was a constant topic of discussion among grunts about who would win if you put Bruce Lee up against Muhammad Ali or Chuck Norris up against Sugar Ray Robinson. I knew it was something special, and I knew that one day it would take off. That's when Horton came up with the idea, well, let's make this thing official, let's make it public. If the American people find out. The world will find out. And in came Art Davey, who had a background of sales and marketing. And what I said to him was, I think it belongs on pay-per-view. At the time, I called it the War of the Worlds. And I wound up writing a 65-page business plan. I was pitching it at the time by telling people, you turn off the sound and you just watch this. You watch a sumo wrestler get into the ring, into this cage that we built, the octagon, and I said, you don't even need sound to see what's going on. We raised uh, almost a quarter of a million dollars. Semaphore Entertainment Group, producers of pay-per-view events, partnered up. Denver, with no formal boxing commission, was chosen as the venue. The idea was to have one man representing each fighting style, so in one night they would know which style was the best. There was always that thought, like what would happen if a good striker fought a good wrestler? Would a judo guy be able to beat a karate guy? In 1993, Horian Gracie and promoter Art Davey set out to find competitors for the first Ultimate Fighting Championship. I reached out early on to martial arts organizations all over the country, in fact, all over the world. I put ads in Black Belt and an Inside Kung Fu and Inside Karate. And the first show, I, I think we, we wound up with some 70 applications. Seven fighters from various disciplines were chosen. But one question remained. I sat down with Horian and said, okay, who in your family is gonna represent Gracie Jiu-Jitsu? So when the time comes to choose, okay, who do we put in? Hickson would be the most obvious choice. He was the best of the family. I turned to Horian and said, it's gonna be Hickson, right? But Horian thought he was a little too big, beating somebody 200. Yeah, it wouldn't be as impressive, Horton thought. Well, let's choose another guy who is more slender, and looks unassuming, and looks undangerous. And I was like, I want me, give me a chance. <laughs> Horton finally turned to me and said, it's going to be Hoyce. I said, Hoyce? I said, but he's the one who babysits your kids. I said, Hoyce is really a sweet kid. I said, but it's going to be Hoyce? Hoyce at the time, you know, hadn't done much. He looks like a... A little boy, an angel, you know. I knew him as just a good kid who on a Saturday afternoon would show up at the academy and Horian would open the safe and take out you know, three or four $20 bills and he'd give Hoist the money and Hoist would go over to the Redondo Beach Pier and hang out, surf a little bit, flirt with the girls. But Hoist did not have a checking account. He did not have a credit card. He lived above the garage with a fish, a piranha, two piranhas. He was just a big kid. In a perfect world, I wouldn't be a fighter. Never had a fight in the street. Not a mean person. So why do you fight? Because I know what I'm doing. I'm stubborn and I'm patient.